We know that the Bible is long and for many people an intimidating book, but we believe that the entire thing is telling one unified story that leads us to Jesus. And so we want to help you learn how to read the Bible as you actually read through the entire thing for yourself. So the Read Scripture experience is first of all a reading plan that has broken up the story of the Bible into 16 chapters. Now we've rearranged the order of some of the books to help you see how this overall story works and how each book contributes to it. So we begin with creation of the world and the fall of humanity which leads to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family, the people of Israel. Then you come to God's rescue of Israel in the exodus from Egypt, which is followed by the covenant God makes with them at Mount Sinai. From there, God leads Israel through the wilderness and then into the promised land, where Israel grows into a nation and breaks the covenant. And so this flows into the rise and the fall of Israel's kingdom, which ends with Israel being exiled from the land. Now the story pauses right here, and you'll read through the poetry of the prophets who lived before Israel's exile, and also of the wisdom writings that reflect on this part of the story as well. After this, the story will pick up again, and you'll read the writings of the prophets who lived during the exile, then about the return of Israel from exile, and the writings of the prophets who lived after the exile. You'll conclude the Old Testament with the book of Chronicles. It's a summary of the story so far and how it all points forward to Jesus. And finally, we come to Jesus himself and his announcement of the kingdom of God, which is then followed by the letters of the apostles to the people of Jesus' kingdom. Finally, we'll conclude the entire biblical story with the Revelation, a poetic vision of Jesus' return and the healing of all creation. Now each of these 16 chapters has a number of reading sessions it will take to complete it. Some of these are shorter, others are longer. And if you take just 15 to 20 minutes a day to complete each session, you'll be able to read through the entire Bible in less than a year. Now, even with this map, many books of the Bible are really confusing. It's very easy to get lost. And so when you start each new book of the Bible, you'll be able to watch a short video that lays out that book's structure and flow of thought, and it'll give you tips about what kinds of things to look for as you read. But also, every book contributes to the overall story of the Bible as well. And so we'll have theme videos placed at strategic points in the reading plan to help you see how the part of the Bible you're reading at the moment fits into that larger story. Finally, each day's reading session includes a psalm, because we believe that reading the Bible is not just an intellectual experience, but also spiritual. And so we invite you to take the year to develop the daily habit of praying through the psalms. And by the end of the year, you'll have prayed through the whole book of psalms two and a half times. Our hope is that the Read Scripture experience will help you read through the entire Bible with greater understanding than you ever have before. So you can see for yourself the beauty and the wisdom of this ancient story that points us to Jesus. Everybody, uh, Tell me, uh, who's in? Who's in? Raise your hand. You're like, I'm doing this. You didn't know coming in. Raise your hand. Okay, everybody's in. Pagans, the rest of you. All right, so, but jump in. It's going to be awesome. I'm joking. Not really. Um, so I hope that you'll be a part of this. Also that, watch this, not to check off a box. I can challenge our students, uh, many of our young people to say, man, do something that, that very few teenagers have, have done. You'd be a small percentage. Um, and I guess now, I, yeah, so now you're superior. Um, read through the Bible. Many adults have not read through the whole Bible. And a year from now, we're going to say, we did it, but watch this. Not to check off boxes, but instead so that we might follow Jesus every day. And we're going to be helping you, guide you there. We're going to be looking, in fact, start out the story today in Genesis. You can turn in your Bible to Genesis. You guys may want to turn the lights up just a little bit so we can look uh, at the Word of God. Now, as you're turning there, that's not hard to find, is it? I want to just pause for a moment and celebrate with you, okay? As a church family, I know you've heard a lot today. We've had a great time of worship. I just want to tell you one more thing, because I'm so hyped about the coming year, but I'm so excited about what God has done in our past year, this 2018. Uh, and it, it's regard to, in regard to our giving, We've challenged you, and, and so often we challenge, and come on, church family, and let's give. Let's all together make a difference. And we said at the end of the year, uh, many of you know, that, that about 20, 20 to 25 percent of our budget comes in at that last part of December, really. And uh, so you can see every week we, you know, full disclosure about where we are always uh, in a timely manner. And you can see in our bulletin 
that we are, it's, it notes that, that we are here over $263,847. But watch this, watch this. Over the past, uh, this past month, we, we have seen $3.5 million. If you say that fast enough, it's like not, $3.5 million, not, not a big deal. $3.5 million, 26% of our budget has come in in one month. We are now $415,104 beyond our projected hopes of where we would be right now. This is worth celebrating and praising God for. Every single one of you, every one of us. Every young person who gives, every child who gives a dollar, every one of us. Those who have a lot, give a lot. Those who have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. Because we're all doing this to the praise of His glorious grace. And watch this. The, you know, our fiscal year is from July 1 to the end of June. So it's not like, yes, we've crossed the finish line. We made it. No, this sets us up for the coming uh, six months ahead for all the ministry that we desire uh, to accomplish. So I just want to say as your pastor, man, I'm just overwhelmed by your generosity and uh, just, yeah, we're so grateful. So way to go, church family. We're so hyped. Was that already said earlier today? No, good. I got to do that. Good. I I just realized. Yeah, that's right. That wasn't said earlier, was it? Good. Okay, y'all celebrated well. So, all right, Genesis 1. Here we go. I got about 20 minutes to, to bring this message to you today and we'll do that. Genesis 1, here we go. You know, Genesis, uh, it means beginnings, all right? So this is our our series that we were walking into the next six weeks. We're going to go through the first 12 chapters. And watch this, for clarification, um, our reading plan is not going to match every single week, okay? Um, Because we we get off in Leviticus and we see the crowd just start dropping, you know, or something. Uh, Not really. Uh, Leviticus is awesome. But um, but we're going to... We're going to read through Scripture, but we're going to start the year to get us in a pattern. And even today, I want to show you how to read Scripture, how to look at it, how to apply it, right? And so today, we're going to start no better place than at the beginning, origin, all right? Which is not only the explanation of how all things are created, no, how about why things are created, but, but why we're in this mess we're in, it tells the human story. If you don't understand Genesis 1 and 2 and 3... You don't understand life. It's the framework for all of life. That's why it was written. All right. So look at it. Chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there is light. And God said, the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and he called darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, many of you have read the the creation narrative. You're going to tomorrow. Um, And what we see now is a repetition. Okay, we're not going to read all of that because what happens is there's this kind of repetition. In fact, a lot of people read the first couple of chapters of Genesis and go, wait, is that... Is that contradictory? I thought he already created man. Now they're, wait, he's creating man now. He's great. Is there, what's going on here? Watch this. Chapter one is a song. So like a song, you probably heard it today. You go back to the chorus. Okay, let's go to the bridge. Back to the chorus. Let's go back. You see repetition. It's, it's like poetry. Chapter one is a certain genre. Chapter two is another genre. Chapter 2 tells now in greater detail what's happened in chapter 1. But the repetition we see here in chapter 1 is God creating, God seeing that it's good. There's one day, and here comes another day. And it's not until day 6 that he creates man and woman, okay? But here's the important thing to understand about Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2 is not written to tell us how. I'm not going to get into, don't have time, But watch this. We're going to have a podcast that's going to be out every week that's going to go deeper into what we can't get to, right, in our our sermon time. Travis and I are going to do, we'll have others probably guests along the way. But it'll be a lot of fun. We'll point you to it in the days to come. If you're not following us on, like, Instagram, social media, do that. Because every week, too, I'll be giving you some encouragement um, from from those platforms, all right? So... uh, the, the interesting thing or very important thing to note in Genesis 1 is it's not telling us how, 
Okay, things were created. People want to know, was it 24-hour period of time? See the word yom, it can mean 24. Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. Yom can mean day. It can mean a period of time. It can mean a season. It can mean an era. It's a time that has a beginning and an end. It's a designated time. Okay, so I've got all kinds of opinions about that, having studied this through the years. Was it, was it 24-hour period of time? Was it seven days? Did he create? Did a snake really talk? Really? Did that really happen? You know, all of these questions, the point is not how. The point, watch this, is why. Genesis 1 answers the question, Genesis 2, why? Genesis 3 answers, why are we in the mess we're in? See, it tells the story of why. That's the most important question in all of life, right? Why? And what we see here is in the beginning, God. Okay, watch this. Why? God. Well, how? God. In a world of idols, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. He's coming out of Egypt and he says, all right, let's start with this. There's one God. In the beginning, God. And here's what I want us to do today. I want us to look at what creation proves about God. What is it revealing? Okay. Creation proves that God is. It proves that he is revealing himself to us. It proves that he's drawing us in and it proves that he will see ultimately he's drawing us out. And so as we leave, I'm going to send you out with a challenge. First of all, creation proves that God is. All right. This is the easiest uh, proof or evidence for the existence of God. I've talked to atheists through the years, and some of us here, maybe you're struggling with belief. I get that. We all struggle with belief. The prayer is always, Lord, help me with my unbelief. But watch this. Those who say, and you may have friends who are like, no, I know friends who are atheists. I was with my crazy uncle over Christmas. He's an atheist. I mean, he told me. He's, you know, he doesn't believe. You may have people in your life like that. You know people who are that way. But the Bible tells us, Paul says that those who do not believe, watch this, are suppressing the truth about God. You know what the Bible says, the operative word about atheism? The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Why is that? Because in our modern sophistication, we skip past the simplest argument for the existence of God as if it's no big thing and it is the biggest thing. How do we know God exists? Because we do. It's simple cause and effect. Take the Bible out of it, right? It's Arist Aristotelian logic. Aristotle's law of cause and effect. For every effect, there must be a cause. And yes, here's what blows our minds. God is the uncaused. He's the uncaused one because he's God. But because there is a, a thing, there must be a creator. Because there's anything, right? So in the beginning, God is what it says. He self-exists. He is eternal. He's before all things. And let me ask you this. The one who created all things... All creation screams his glory. The one who created your life. Is this the person, capital P, that you allow to be your personal assistant on Monday morning? I mean, really? This is the God you bow down to. You worship. You run to church on Sunday mornings. You can't wait to get here. And you want everybody you know to be here because we're going to praise the God who has made us. This is the God that has created us. He's, he's drawing us in, as we'll see. Because look at this. Secondly, creation proves that God's revealing himself. Now, what's he revealing? Well, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare his glory. Right? Everything in creation knows that it's loved by God. I mean, you think about it. The, the mountains display his glory. His glory is his character, who he is, right? I, I mean, from... from all of the stars, the moon, the flowers. What about a spring day at the beginning of January? Screaming. I hope you're out in it today, by the way. If you go to White Rock Lake, watch out. I might run over you. Um, because I'm going to get out in it. Because it screams his glory. All of creation knows that it's loved. Every flower, every lake, every mountain, every star, the quasars, the kangaroo, the koala, my, my little gypsy doodle knows that she's loved by God. And, and she is happy, right? She doesn't have a care in the world because she's costing me an arm and leg. But, um, but she's awesome. She knows that she's loved by God. Everything in creation except for us. There's more of that story as we'll get to here in a moment. Look at what Paul says in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, 
his eternal power and divine nature, as if to say parenthetically, his invisible qualities, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That's why I've likened the atheist to the guy who tried to get rid of his old boomerang and he about killed himself trying to throw away his old one. Because he says, there is no God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There is no God. A sunset. Whoa. There is no God. A baby's born. There's no God. The beauty of love and all things that come at us. There is a God and it's evident to all of us. Is why Paul says you're suppressing the truth when you say there's no God. You're constantly. Suppress- now, there's a point at which someone can say, I'm, I'm suppressing the truth. Suppressing. And God says, you want to know what it's like to live without me? Bam. Have at it. Let's see how that goes. Let's, let's watch this play out. All for our good. To turn us back to him. And friend, in whatever area of your life you're saying, I will not choose God's way. He's going he's to allow you into this downward spiral. We see it in chapter 2. We're going to see it in chapter 3 next week. He's going to take us down in order to raise us up. As if it's built into the plan. Because he knows that he's going to draw us unto himself. We're going to see this today. So what does creation prove about? What is he revealing? We've said it already. He is self-existent. He's uncaused. He's eternal. He, is, he exists in and of himself, to himself. Everything else exists because of him. All right? And then he is all-powerful. Right? He's omnipotent. We make up names to try to describe him. He, he speaks. Watch this. He speaks a word and things are created. In fact, we, we don't see him create anything without speaking it into existence. He speaks a word and things come into existence. All of the universe. And then it says he is, uh, he is loving. All right, that's, that's my next point here. He's let, now, you might say in a first reading, you go, well, I don't know if we know that yet, do we? Do we know this yet? Do we know that he's loving? Well, you look at all creation. You look at all that he's made. And, of course, we're going to see that he gives humans a chance over and over again. He's drawing us in. He creates out of love. And watch this. He is beautiful. Right? The created thing points to the creator. Whenever I see a beautiful piece of art, I go, man, who did this? When I hear a song... Like we've sung today, even you go, who wrote this? You see something that's beautiful. You see a design of some sort. In fact, people talk about intelligent design. That's, that's a misnomer. If, it, if there's design, there's intelligence behind it. And if it's beautiful, there's beauty behind it. We see it in each other's faces. We see it in relationships. He's powerful. He's loving. You watch a, um, you watch a movie sequence that brings you to tears. You read a book and you go, who did this? Why is it that we're moved by beauty so much? Because it's inherent. It's in us. God's created us. Watch this. He's created us. He, he's beautiful. But watch this. He's relational. He's relational. Now, this could be self-evident. If he's loving, if he's created us, there must be some connection there, right? Because I hear a lot of people who think, well, what was God doing before eternity, right? I mean, he's like off on his, what is that, dark? and What, what was he doing? What, what, what? He got lonely. He was lonely, so he created us. That's why he made us. Listen, you may be awesome. God does not need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He's self-existent. He is happy, beautiful, wonderful without us. Somehow he wants us. He doesn't need us, but he creates us to have relationship with him, right? I could say it this way. God is community common unity in and of himself. Now, much could be said about this next verse here. Look at chapter 1, verse 26, 27, as we keep on. Then God said, let us, you've seen this before, make man in our image. What's up with this? Now, some have noted, what is this? This is, there seems to be like this Supreme Court of sorts. There, there's this council that's with God. Again, all things were created by him, but somehow there's this, this council. We see it in the book of Job. We saw it when we were in Job. You see it in other places in the Old Testament. What is this about? What is this? We'll talk more about that. But we know at the core of it is that he is a triune God. In his essence and his nature, he is community. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, okay? Rulership. 
Let them reign and rule over the fish of the sea, the livestock, creeping things. And then verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Here it is. Male and female, he created them. Watch this. He's pursuing us. He is pursuing us in relationship. Look at thirdly, I want you to see creation proves that God is drawing us in. Creation proves that he desires a relationship with us because watch this, we too are relational beings. We're created in his image. So we too are relational. This is why Paul says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, for us not to embrace the reality of God is to suppress the truth in righteousness. More on that next week. I'll hint at it this week. He's drawing us in, but why? For what purpose? Verses 26, 27 there reveal a, a portion of the purpose. We are co-laborers. Co We're even co-creators, male, female, and co-creators. He's given us created gifts, creative gifts. We are rulers. We're reigning. We're given dominion over all things as his highest creation on the planet. We're viceroys. We rule along with him, beside him, co-rulers. But watch this. He goes into greater detail, what I noted earlier. Chapter 2, turn to chapter 2, verse 7. It says this. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust. Look at this. Man of dust, he calls him. From the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He breathes into him. And because God breathes his own breath into him, the man becomes a living creature. And the Lord God planted in the in the garden in a garden, uh, in a garden in Eden, in the east. So watch this. Out of chaos, darkness, ultimately He creates this beautiful, orderly garden for man, for woman, mankind, if you will, to live and to flourish. And then it says he, he, he put him in the east and there he put the man that he'd formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh oh, now introduces this tree of life. The tree of life, we'll see you next week, is all that is good. We can draw from. He doesn't say don't eat from that one. We'll see. He says don't eat from the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I always wondered, what, what is that? He doesn't want us to know what's right and wrong. What's the deal there? Listen, here's what's happening. To eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to reject God as the source of what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, and declare, I will decide what's right and wrong. I will not embrace his word. I won't follow him. I will enter into my own thoughts and desires. I will decide what's right and wrong. I will turn away from God as the source of authority and power. I'm a reigning, ruling uh, person of dominion over creation under the rule and authority of God so that I might flourish under his design. Instead, I will decide what's right and wrong. Any connection to our modern, sophisticated selves? Anybody? This is where our world is. This is the temptation of our lives every single day. Where are you prone to go and say, you know, that part of the word, that seems out of date, really. That might be on the wrong side of history is what I'm thinking. I think maybe things have changed. I'm not going to trust God's word. I'm going to decide which way to go here. And this is where we're going to find ourselves next week. We're going to find ourselves in trouble, right? Well, let's, let's land this so that we don't remain in trouble. He creates man, right? This word is Adam. It means human. It means humankind. It means mankind. He creates man, and then he creates the woman. And once creation comes to male and female, the name shifts. It's Ish. He's a male. She is Isha, which is really the opposite of male, is what that means. Like him, but opposite. The mirror of him. His supplement. They complement one another. Not one greater than the other. But beautiful in relationship. And because true love is chosen love. He says you guys can choose to love me. Or you can choose to decide for yourself what is right and wrong. But if you go that route. It's going to lead to a downward spiral. And you have no idea. And we find ourselves now there. Because we too have rejected the source of life. In Genesis 2.18 it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And so now the woman, Isha, 
becomes the opposite of this man. This is not simply the start of, of a new, uh, watch this, the origin of family. We'll get to that. The or, but this is the, this is the start of relationships. God's created us to have relationships with one another. And think about this. They're placed in the garden as co-creators, co-workers. And then at the end of chapter 2, an unusual thing there. And when I was a kid, I always read this or child's Bible or something you have at home. And it has, you know, the big fig leaf coming across. And it's like, wait, they're naked. What are they doing? You know, they're walking around naked. Yeah, he's naked. What is going on? And it ends with, they were both naked. And they were unashamed. This is a beautiful beautiful picture of their relationship right relationship with God right relationship with one another no relational strife no sin no self salvation project no no self justification no embarrassment no regrets just selfless love and if you're sitting here like me thinking I wish my relationships were that way they can be that's what he's called us to But it starts as we have a right relationship with Him. So chapter 3, everything changes. As we'll get in next week, the fall, you'll read about it this week. So all creation is at one with its maker, but not us. We're at quarrel with our maker. We've chosen our own way. But friends, here's the beauty of it all. Here's where we'll land. There's another place in the Bible that starts with in the beginning. Anybody know where that is? Anybody? John 1. In the beginning. Look at this. In the beginning was the Word. Watch the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now we're starting to see. Wait, wait. This is making more sense now. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created or made through him. And without him was nothing made that has been made. In him was life. The life that's breathed into men. And watch this. And it was the light of men. You see it hearkening back to the creation story. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now we know why the word has agency. The word has active power. The Word is a person. And His name is Jesus. Jesus comes. And as we've celebrated this past week, the perfect human, the new man, shows up Emmanuel with us. And watch this. He's making all things new. He's recreating. He's still creating. And he's bringing people into his family to be so that he might be king, master, lord, ruler. He's drawing us in, but watch this, in order that he might draw us out. Creation proves. Christ, this redemptive story proves. He's calling us out. What do I mean? He's saying that the life that you want to live, the life I've I've created you to live, is not one where you're drawing from something other source than me as king of your life. You want to live a life. Jesus comes and he says, let me show you what the perfect life looks like. It's a life lived for others. It's selfless love. It's the way it was back in the garden. But watch this. So much so he goes to the cross. He dies on a cross and the word speaks out and there's silence. He cries out and he's not heard. He's not heard so that we can can be heard. He becomes formless without form and he is void. He is unmade so that we might be remade. He takes on all of sin, your sin, before you ever cried your first tear of confession and repentance, before you ever called out to him, he made a way. So that you could come back to him and be remade. Watch what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. I love this. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then he goes on. Look at this. In in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 47. The first man was from the earth. A man of dust. The second man is from heaven As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. 
just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. Those of us who've received Christ, and friends, here's the challenge before we, we close in prayer here. Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, watch this. You are a man, a woman of dust. Dead and dying. Without life. But when you turn to Him, the one who's come from heaven to be born again, He breathes His life into you by the power of His Holy Spirit. And you then are able to live the life that you've been created to live. You return back to the garden, if you will, naked and unashamed before the Father. Love for free. Your worth, your identity is found in Him. You can then love others without any need for love in return because all the love you need, you have found in Him. You're able to forgive. Friends, life's too short not to forgive. Not to love people right where they are. People in your family, people in your home, people you work with, get over it. Love them. Just love them. Well, but Jeff, you don't know. They're to blame. I mean, they are the one. No, love them. Love without restraint. That's the way of life. And watch what happens when you receive Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let's all read this together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this miraculous story we find ourselves in. Lord, we don't, we, don't, we don't invite you into our story as if inviting you into our lives. You invite us into your story. You were here before we existed. You created us. We have breath today because of you. The only right thing to do is come back to where we belong. Innocent, set free because you have come, not just to show us the way, but to be the way. Not just our example, but our substitute. I pray for those here. Friend, if you're here and you've not received Christ, you can do it right now by faith, not by works. Praise Him. It's not works. Just say, Lord, come into my life on this first Sunday of this new year. Make me the person you've created me to be by forgiving me of my sin. I believe that you came. You died on the cross for my sin. My shame, my punishment has been taken away upon you. And my response is to worship you with my life. I give you my life. Set me free to the life that is really life. Be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name we pray.